Welcome to The State of Us. Beyond mainstream cable news and party lines, with a millennial and a boomer, The State of Us pushes past the noise and uncovers all the issues that matter. Here's your host, Justin T. Weller. With Bernie Sanders out of the race, it is essentially down to Joe Biden and President Donald Trump. What do each of them need to do to win the presidency in 2020? How should they confront one another? And how should the United States ensure free and fair elections this November in the age of COVID-19? That's what we're looking at today. Hopefully Why You Care is pretty straightforward. If there ever was a time to question whether or not leadership matters, uh, again, regardless of what your judgment is about how leadership's going, now is certainly one of those times where our politicians are at the forefront of society, and it probably leads us to question, how do we want these individuals to handle such things, and what are we looking for, really, in our leadership? But of course, we couldn't begin a conversation on former Vice President Joe Biden and the current president, Donald Trump, and all things politics without. True Chat senior historian and an educator of more than 30 years, here is your friendly redneck liberal, Lance Jackson. Well, somebody has to be president, right, this year? That's what they tell us, right? Uh, okay. Somebody, somebody somewhere wrote down in some document that supposedly this is, this is one of those years where we have to uh, make that decision. So, and it's a year that ends in a zero, too. That's right. Just throwing that out there. <laughs> so, there will be an election of some sorts. Yes. And we will get a president of some sorts who takes over, hopefully, in January of 2021 in some form or fashion. Th- those be it all, be it all streamed to us or <clears throat> in person, or if we have a nationwide Zoom session. A nationwide Zoom session. I don't know. It probably right? it'd probably crash. I think. That, I mean, there seems like there's an awful lot of questions to be answered between now and next January, and who's going to be there, and how this is all going to take place. This ought to be a a pretty wild shot in the dark today. <laughs> well, we're going to try to do our best, but the reason, as many of our listeners, I'm sure, can imagine that we've decided to talk about this, is because it is one of those things that's kind of getting glossed over. We're used sure. we're used to election years like this being all about the the presidential election. And really, uh, since kind of the stay at home orders went in place with the exception of Bernie's announcement that he was out, we've uh, it's been mostly radio silence. I think there was something from from President Obama and him officially endorsing Biden. But uh, with the with those save those two things, uh, very little on the election front, which is odd for the United States in a presidential election year like this. So what we're going to do today in our in our first segment here is we're going to look at what Biden needs to do in order to win. We're also going to talk about Bernie Sanders a little bit and his supporters because they're kind of the they're kind of that ongoing wild card and and even now perhaps more so than than before. Uh, and then in segment two, we're going to look at what Trump needs to do. So if you're interested, we're we're talking about both. We're trying to give you that perspective of they've got kind of very different things to do if they want to win. And there's different ways to go about it. And in the last segment, we're going to talk about who's likely to win and what's necessary to make sure that we have free and fair elections, regardless of what the situation is, whether the economy is open and people are out again or not. This November. So we got a lot to talk about, but let's start with Biden, Lance. Keys to victory. I think one of those big ones, right, is how he chooses to campaign in this very precarious time. Uh, Trump's well, out there. I'm not sure. I'm not sure how you campaign. Right. Well, because Trump's out there every no, day. I, mean, right? I really don't. He, I mean, he's got the press conference. I mean, people see right. him all the time, and we're not really seeing a lot of Joe. Right. And I think that, and that's why I was, you know, talking about that nationwide Zoom session or, or however you're going to do it. Um, because this is, we're, we're walking in uncharted waters right now. This should be the, the height of the primary season. Um, and I think vice president, former vice president Biden is, um, a little bit behind the eight ball because I think he needed a, a good debate or two with Bernie to get him ready to talk to, uh, with President Trump you know, to, to debate Trump come this fall. And, you know, will we even have any kind of debates? Um, and does that, I almost think that that benefits Biden 
Mm. I hate to say that, but I think um, no debates, not having, yeah, no debates. I think would will benefit Biden because I he got to looking Biden got to looking better as the process went on, but he did a lot of stumbling and bumbling up there when there were a lot of people on stage, and he kind of got into his A game a little bit, and then it was almost like if you remember, and I know I'm one of those I'm trying to remember too. We really weren't sure what was going to happen. And then everybody started dropping out and being seen with Biden and announcing their support with Biden. Remember Buttigieg in Texas and then Klobuchar right. in Texas. And then, you know, all of these things started to snowball and it was almost like, okay, it appeared that there was a decision made by the DNC that we're going to put all of our chips in one basket and support Biden. and. Um, there was going to be a good, I think, debate between within the Democratic Party between those people and the Bernie supporters, the the left wing of the Democratic Party. And then you have this whole situation that we're dealing with now, the COVID-19 situation. And now that's all been taken out. You know, what I mean, and it looked like, you know, once Biden got the support of those other minor candidates, um, it was going to be an interesting, you know, it, it, the writing was on the wall for Bernie not to win, but he was still going to have a voice. You know, now you, the kind of the archaic, the the not so fun, nitty gritty stuff of who's going to make uh, the planks, right? Right. Who's going to come up with uh, the ideas for the Democrats now? How much of a voice are Bernie and his supporters going to get? Uh, in, in the face of this pandemic, what's going to happen, you know? Um, so I, I, I think, you know, Biden has already put out a viral response to the president's early leadership against this. So I, I think it was going to be an interesting situation to sit back and watch. And we really don't have anything to compare it to. Right. Yeah. So we're all going to just have to go back, you know, sit back and watch and, and uh, discuss it in real time. And, get a feel for how the country's taking things in real time from both the president and from Biden. It's interesting as you bring up, some people might see the current situation as a disadvantage for Joe Biden, but in some other ways, uh, it's it's an advantage uh, because you, you are in a situation now where uh, he is not going to be in some of those situations that are uncomfortable for him or that he doesn't do as well in. Uh, you know, and, and that is to say that I think he's got some video stuff. You know, I was looking at his website actually just here a second ago and, you know, he's doing some virtual town halls and some stuff like that, but I don't think those don't get the same type of press coverage as your in-person stuff. So the real challenge, and I think what we have to see that's going to play out is can you get the people that are on the fence to come to that virtual stuff? Because, uh, typically, we know from the episode that we did earlier in the year, Lance, about persuading voters that you've got to do that. It's the most effective in person. So with the in-person option out, at least for now, and maybe that'll come back before the elections, maybe the ground game can be remobilized. But I don't even see, right, even if we're reopening the economy and we're back out there, I'm not sure that that gets back up to full scale by any means, even if we even if we open back up. Um, for lots of reasons, because the door to door thing opens, you know, some hurdles that you don't have if you're just going to work and that type of thing. So I, I'm not sure that it's going to be so easy to see uh, how Biden makes up for that part of it, because while it's not totally reliant on him, your field, your field work, your canvassing, um, some of your surrogate events, that stuff inevitably goes into uh, your swing voters. And those are the ones, as we know, it's not not really as much about Joe Biden's base as it is some of these people that haven't decided. And I think a lot of those are those Bernie supporters. They have a very specific idea of what they're after. And whether or not they show up is going to be really, I think, critical to Joe, because uh, if they don't, and we know that, you know, historically speaking, Democrats often are the ones that we struggle with turnout on a little bit more than Republicans, uh, 
you know, that that could be the make or break. It might not matter what Joe does or what he says in between now and then. If turnout's bad, it'll be interesting to see because I don't know. I don't have a strong feeling that way. I think it does help in some ways, but it's definitely a hindrance because you're always fighting that uphill battle against uh, an incumbent. And Trump's Trump's out there every day, you know, with his with his briefing, which again, whatever you think of it, that not really the point. He he is definitely in front of the national audience and on the news media basically every day. And Biden's not in front of people in that same way. It's going to be both of them now kind of get to have um, a pep rally any day they want it, you know, um, and because they're not going to probably, I mean, I, I guess we'll see, I guess if you're uh, an optimist, which um, I usually mm. don't tend to be, if you're an optimist, everything's going to be okay by the fall. And we'll get, you know, the two or three debates and we'll get to see it all play out. But I just don't think it's going to play out that way. And um, I do think it's I think that benefits Biden um, because he's not going to be able to, as I said, he's not going to be, have been able to really fine tune his debate skills. Um, and I think he's going to be better off just standing up in front of his supporters and selling all the reasons why he should be the president. Instead of Donald Trump, um, he is on record as saying he's going to pick a female as a vice presidential running candidate. So we'll see um, if he stays true to that. And that will be an interesting wild card as well. And then you, you just don't know what the left wing of the Democratic Party is going to do. Will they, you know, there, there's no third party candidate out there yet that we know of. Um but will they stay home and allow Donald Trump to have another chance at four more years of the presidency just because they feel like they've been slighted by the Democratic Party? Uh, I, I think that is the ultimate question for Biden. Certainly don't envy the place that uh, that the Democrats or the Biden campaign are in. It is, as Lance said, kind of unprecedented. The, the situation that's being faced. So it will be interesting to see how they handle that. Although coming up, we have another important question to answer. What does President Trump need to do in order to win? How should he approach governing right now? How should he approach campaigning? And what should he do when confronting Joe Biden in this virtual arena? Answers to those questions and more. Keep it here on The State of Us, and we'll be right back. The State of Us. Here's your host, Justin T. Weller. Bernie Sanders is out. Joe Biden's in. And President Donald Trump, well, he's on national TV pretty much every day. We've talked so far about what Joe Biden needs to do in order to win the presidency. But what does Donald Trump need to do in order to keep the presidency? As Lance mentioned in the first segment, we're certainly in some unprecedented times, particularly because it's a presidential election year. And we've got to first look at what are the keys for Trump from a campaign standpoint, right? He's got the governing standpoint, and it's kind of hard to separate these, Lance, right now, right? Because we're up here on the podium as the president, and it's usually hard to separate them. I mean, it's not usually easy. You're a sitting president. They kind of, those lines sort of blur, even if we're supposed to keep them separate. Uh, we know that's not really how that works. Uh, but now even more so, because uh, Trump's up on that podium every day, right? And he's he's using that to convey his message, as presidents do. Um, but Biden doesn't have quite that same capacity to uh, to demand the network's attention. I, I think what's interesting is that as far as governing, there's there were a couple different polls that came out yesterday, and this kind of shows too. On one hand, on the first one, that we always trust our own people more than we trust somebody else. You know, they were, they were really hitting it hard that um, most people trusted their governor almost twice as much as they trusted the president on the handling of the coronavirus. And while that sounds really bad, it's also very normal in that people tend to trust those people that we think we have better contact with and better knowledge of. Like the congressman approval thing, right? Exactly. Right. You know, we hate Congress, but uh, you know, 
82 percent of us like our congressman. Right. You know, <laughs> if all of Congress was like my congressperson, then it would be great. You know, my congressperson is awesome. Uh, it's just we got to change the other, uh, you know, 534 of them uh, and then we'd be OK. Um, but the second thing that really gets me right now is that and I think it's why it makes it such a, an interesting presidential race this year is half the country is still supporting President Trump. So no matter how you feel about this, the country split on the job that President Trump is doing as president. Half the country can't stand what he's doing and the other half supports what he's doing. So whichever side of it, if you have strong feelings on one side or the other on this issue, half the country disagrees with you. It's not like 80% of us think he's doing a great job or 80% of us think he's doing a horrible job. If you think he's doing a horrible job, you have to understand that 50% of the country thinks he's doing a good job. Right. And if you think he's doing a great job and what more can we expect of somebody who is president at this time, you have to understand there's 50% of the American people who don't agree with you. They think he, that our president's doing a lousy job. And to me, that sets up a very, very interesting time for the president in trying to get reelected. And I think, you know, he is, he does have his daily, uh, campaign speech that he's getting to give, you know, in the, in the eyes of, I'm talking about COVID-19, but basically it's a, he, he seems to give things that make him sound good. And then he goes off and talks about whatever points he wants to make about the economy or a trade deal with China or all the good things that he's doing. It was basically a campaign stop for him. And then he turns it over to, his doctors or the vice president to get into the nitty gritty stuff about COVID-19. So he's getting to campaign every night. Here you and I are talking about the, these are unprecedented times and what does all this mean for the election? Maybe it doesn't matter, right? I mean, maybe uh, this isn't any different than 2016 or any other election. It's about do you do you get the right people out in the right states? Because these poll numbers aren't all that different from the range that President Trump's been in pretty much his whole presidency. Right. I mean, they're really not. I mean, I know everybody's talking about, you know, look how many people disapprove of how the president's doing this. But it's like, yeah. And that's about the same as it's been on anything else that we've encountered. Any other issue that he's taken on in the last three years. You know, I mean, there were a couple polls here or there that showed maybe there were some Republicans who weren't super happy about it. But on the average, like you talked about, when you, when you take them all together, it's it's really about the same as it's always been. So maybe it's back to the Democrats have to get, uh, they have to win the states they didn't win in 2016. They cannot neglect the Midwest like they did the last time. Cause it's that's going to come down to what's Wisconsin going to do. Right. What's, what's Michigan going to do and around Detroit? What are the suburbs, the affluent suburbs around Philadelphia going to do? What are the affluent suburbs of Virginia going to do? Those were all, you know, Republicans who decided to go with Trump. Right. And then they went against Trump in the 2018 congressional races. And we saw a big Democratic victory in 2018 because in those key states that Trump had to win because, you know, you and I were doing uh, an election night show. And as the results came in, it was like, well, Trump's got to get this, 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 and this. Here's something. And he got, and he got this, 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 and this. And it was those parts that we just talked about. Right. So he lost those in 2018. So now is he going to get them back? Because that is his road to victory. Right. I mean, give credit where credit is due. He had one road to victory and he managed to find a way to sneak it out to win in the electoral college, even though he was defeated, not, I don't know, fairly soundly, you know, a good way to put it, but he was by a a wide margin defeated in the popular vote, but he found the electoral college route to the presidency. And he basically needs the same route again. Right. And he lost it in 2018. So when you see those numbers of 50% for and 50% against, that doesn't matter. How's he playing in Michigan? Wisconsin, the suburbs of Philadelphia, and the suburbs of Virginia. If everything else can status, stay status quo, which it looks like it will. There's a, a number of Republican governors in some of the states you've mentioned. Ohio's a, a good example of a state where you have a Republican governor who's 
kind of not directly going against Trump, but definitely from a policy standpoint, you know, maybe he's not speaking directly against Trump, but the people aren't total idiots, right? I mean, they see that the way that Ohio's treating something and the way that the president's treating it are not the same. I don't know, but maybe one of those one of those keys to victory, Lance, is if the electoral map tells us anything, it isn't about getting the majority of the country on your side. It's about getting the right people in the right places on your side. And here's kind of a, a Joe Biden slash President Trump thing is in those states, if you have a Republican governor, right, who's going against Trump, if you're Biden, I think you got to take that state seriously and say, this is in play. We got to play up because people trust their governor more than they trust the president. We have to play up the way this is going and we have to speak to, you know, the president's not in line with what your local people know your local people need. And if you're the president, you go the other way and maybe you have to try to go the governor's way a little bit more because can you really afford to, to risk in those states having a position contrary to those local officials that those people we already said trust so much. I don't know cuz that's those are the small things, you know, that can that can swing this back and forth. And the last thing I think is the Bernie supporters. We talked about it right with uh Joe Biden, I think it's the same thing for Trump. If he can convince one of two things, them to stay home or them to come out for him, which sounds crazy, but keep in mind people, Lance and I talked about Remember, we reported on that NPR article that brought up that the the 50,000 or so votes across key swing states just so happened to line up with about the number of Bernie supporters that not only, right, didn't support Hillary, but actually voted for Trump. So, right. you know, again, it's a coincidence. We don't know that those are the same people, but isn't that interesting I mean, you know, I, I think you can't rule that out and say that they're irrelevant because they're certainly not. If they stay home or in in Trump's case, if he can convince them either to not come out or if they come out, at least for most of them or half of them to vote for him, those are those are important things. And I think those states that you're talking about, Lance, people don't like to think about it, but that's what it comes down to. Right. Is can you yeah. can you convince those people that are those swing voters to stay with you, or in this case, to bring them back to your side. But you don't need to go after the swing voters in all the states. I mean, I I don't even, and, and maybe I'm wrong, but at this point in time in the race, I don't think Ohio is a swing state. I think it's solidly in Trump's corner, and Biden needs to focus on those areas that I spoke of in those um, congressional districts, and Biden can win the presidency. And Trump's got to do everything he can to get those people back. And that's where I, why I think what happens here over the summer and into the fall with COVID-19, if all the hard work and the social distancing and people wear masks and do all the things that they've been directed to do and the numbers stay low, that's going to play in Trump's favor. Then we've already seen, and whether it's going to stay or not, you know, the stock market has bounced back. That's going to be a Trump thing. And then he'll start to, if, if this settles down at all, this pandemic settles down at all. Don't forget Joe and Russia and everything else. I mean, he's going to come after Biden and talk about how things went, you know, and how Joe was doing this and how former Vice, Vice President Biden was doing this for his son. And all of that's going to be ramped back up and how the Democrats went after the president and impeached him. And it wasn't fair and it was a witch hunt. And we're going to hear all of that as well. And how is that going to play on the heels of this pandemic? So the president has a lot of different issues to, to go after speaking up from his side of things. So if, and that's where, you know, just to conclude here between the two, I think Biden has to stay very focused where we've read in Hillary's own book where she didn't in Wisconsin, in the suburbs of Philadelphia, in the suburbs of Washington, D.C., around Virginia and Maryland. That's where the Democrats and Vice President Biden have to really stay focused and keep those people on their side that voted for Trump in 2016 and against Trump in 2018. I think that's the heart of the race. And if, if I were if I were running it, that's where I see it now. We're going to look at coming up, kind of wrapping up this little bit of what we've talked about 
recap of what Biden and Trump respectively need to do. What is uh, the key? Who is most likely to win between this matchup? And we've talked some of the keys to victory for both, but but what is the likelihood that either of them, either Trump keeps the presidency or Biden's able to defeat Trump? Those are some big questions we're looking at, but probably most importantly, what we want to end on today is, will there be free and fair elections this November? What needs to be done to ensure that happens? To find out, keep it here on The State of Us, and we'll be right back. The State of Us. Here's your host, Justin T. Weller. What does Joe Biden need to do to win the presidency? And what does President Donald Trump need to do to keep the presidency? We've talked a little bit about that so far in today's episode. Kind of wrapping that up, the question of who's most likely to win. And I'll I'll say this, Lance, and I'll just let you uh, put in your two cents, and then we can talk about the nature of free and fair elections. But you brought up the swing states and the suburbs that that need to be won. And and here's what I'll tell you. I, I think this is what it comes down to. And th- this may oversimplify and people might say I'm biased because I'm an Ohioan and that's probably true. Um, but, you know, the the fact remains that not a single president from Abraham Lincoln through President Donald Trump, not a single Republican president has ever won the White House without Ohio. Not once, not ever since Abraham Lincoln. So to me, if you're Joe Biden, I don't know. I think you got to treat Ohio like you got to figure something out. I don't know what it is. I don't have the answer, Joe. I'm sorry. I'm not your campaign strategist. I don't know what you have to do. But I know that what history tells us is if you could figure out how to take Ohio, Trump loses. So if the game is, you know, how do I win? Um, I think Hillary made the mistake and we saw it in 2016 of – counting on Wisconsin. And that was a mistake, you know, shouldn't have done that. And because you counted on it, you know, or, or said that it wasn't important enough to spend enough time there, uh, she lost, you know? And so I don't know. I, I, I'm afraid that if Joe says I'm riding off Ohio, that we'll go right through the election again. Trump will take Ohio with 60% or more of the vote and, History will be right on the wall like it's always been, which is Trump took Ohio. Trump won the presidency because he's a Republican. And that's one of those keys to victory for him. You know, I don't know. Everybody spent a lot of time on those other states saying that Ohio, you know, wasn't in play and that it wasn't important. And well, here Trump is and he's president and he took 60 percent of the vote in Ohio. So I guess it comes down to I don't think it's likely that Biden wins if he doesn't figure out a plan for um, your swing states, but especially the ones that Lance mentioned. And I think you got to throw Ohio in because of what history tells us. So um, as much as I, and I'm sure listeners know that I would prefer Biden be president over Trump. Um, I, I'm afraid that I don't know what the strategy is to get there unless they can really speak to those Bernie supporters and speak to those swing state voters because uh, you hate to see it do it. You hate to see him do it, but I'm afraid they could repeat 2016 making some similar mistakes. Well, I'll just say it again. I don't. I understand the history part because all right, I'm the history teacher, but I don't think Ohio's in play, and I think I would spend my money and time and resources on trying to win those other states that they lost and um, find a different roadmap. Obviously, uh, play Ohio. But boy, I sure wouldn't put all my cards in Ohio right now. Um, we can see how that changes. It's not that I would write it off, but I would really work in those areas that I mentioned and find a different electoral route. Um, and because, like we said, like I said at the beginning anyway, this is uncharted waters. So maybe we can take Ohio off the board for the Democrats and still find a way to win would be my answer to you. But I think the really the key here. And what I'm really worried about, no matter who wins, is how the public perceives the upcoming election. There's been so much out there talking about voter suppression. Um, here in Ohio, we didn't even get to vote. And there's a big question on, and a Republican governor, you know, didn't even let us vote. Um, and, you know, the constitutionality of that. And now if this kind of stuff goes on, where there's still 
fear. You know, I mean, we're going to be back into flu season by the time the November election takes place. And how many people don't get out or don't, you know, how difficult do these states make it to get um, a ballot, you know, a mail-in ballot? Um, all of those kinds of things will have something to do with voter turnout. And so I think that was going to be the biggest issue to watch. And no matter how it plays out, my greatest fear is that n- nobody's going to be satisfied with the outcome because of what happens during the election process. That's my, I, w- I want the, 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 the freest, fairest election possible. So nobody can really legitimately complain that one side or the other won because things were, the election was run in their favor. 20, 30% are going to complain on either side. But if 60 or 70% of us, you know, 65, 75% of us can say, you know what? It was as free and everybody had a chance and everybody had a chance to vote. And we made it as simple and easy for everybody to vote as possible. And we can just live with who wins. But if it's not, and there are, you know, snafus like we're with the Iowa process, you know, Ohio hasn't voted yet. And we're all going through a new stage of, of how to vote. And Ohio has been under fire with Republicans in control of voter suppression for the last two or three election cycles um, by the Democrats. You have Wisconsin who in the middle of the pandemic said it has to be in-person voting only while they're the gentleman in charge of the elections in the state was standing in full PPE gear saying everybody's safe to come out and vote. Um, Stuff like that, man, if that's going on in November, it's going to be horrible between November and January when the new, the president takes the oath of office, be it Biden or Trump. I think there was no question that, uh, and I mean, you've had Republicans and Democrats who've competed in the past where, you know, they don't maybe like each other, but you can tell they respect each other. Or like, you know, when they say post-election after they've lost that we have to come together around this new president now, you know that they mean it, right? And, right, exactly. But then in 2016, you have a situation where these two are bitter rivals and it took Hillary, you know, longer than it usually takes the loser to uh, to come out and say that. Um, and I think, I don't know how Trump would have handled that because that's not the way it went. But my point there is, I could see, Lance, how what you're saying is exactly what happens because for the first time, you really don't have that. I mean, you have a candidate who comes out and is vehemently like, no way are we accepting, you know, what happened because the process was so botched. And then, and then what happens? I mean, we are so used to, and I think we take for granted the smooth transition of power in this country. But keeping in mind that world history tells us that never happens in a country over its history. At some point, there is always a contested turnover of power. And usually it gets violent and it gets nasty and it's terrible. And I think that's a very valid concern because, you know, we talked about keys to victory for each of them. But you look at keys to victory for the country and the free and fair election is critical because if you win – but you lose half the country because they are are that upset, you know? And we're not talking about like 2016 upset. We're talking about like secession upset, you know, riots upset, violent riots, that type of stuff. Did you really win? You know, was it really worth winning? Um, so I, I agree. I think that's – it's got to be at the forefront of people's minds because we see what happens when it's not. Wisconsin and Ohio are perfect kind of polar opposite examples. Ohio's like, okay, nobody's coming out to vote. And even though we didn't have action by the legislature, which is the only one with constitutional authority to do anything about that, the administrative branch or executive branch, excuse me, just decided that we're just not going to let people come out. And think of that what you will. It doesn't matter if it was the right decision or not. The constitutionality of it I think is still very much in question. You know, right. And then Wisconsin, on the other hand, is like, well, we're just not going to do anything. Everybody just has to come out and risk their lives because voting and everybody knows, I think on this show, Lance and I love voting and believe that's part of why we're talking about this, that it's so important. But to take the Wisconsin approach seems insane. And to take the Ohio approach, if it came down to the very last minute, 
you know, and it was the executive branch that decided that. I don't love that. Not because I don't think that DeWine made the right decision at the very last second, but because I don't think he has the authority to do that. And I think we just kind of let it happen. And maybe that's okay this time, but I don't think it's okay because it sets that precedent for future times. I'm not okay with a governor or a president or anybody saying, well, we're just not going to have your election day. You know, and remember, we don't have a national election. We have 50 individual elections. Right. Well, 51 when you count Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. So we have 51 different elections where we pick our leader. And so you're not going to be playing. Odds are you don't play by the same rules on in a normal election. And this I think this election in November is going to be anything but normal. And so it just really opens it up for. If it if it's even possible for even worse bad blood, and you and I have always talked about how we need to start healing the country, and I'm just so afraid that we're going to tear the wounds even further apart. When I really thought there was an opportunity to heal things, and that's my biggest concern. We pose the question, Lance, to people: Biden versus Trump. Will policies matter? As much as I'd love for policies to matter, Lance, I'm not sure that this time around. Uh, I don't know how much it's going to matter because like we identified, there's a lot of stuff going into this that are going to, I think, influence it so much more than where people stand on some of those traditional issues. Uh, it'll be, it'll, it'll definitely be interesting to see how it plays out, but let us know your thoughts, right? Cause that's, that's part of what we want. Lance and I are worried about this. What can you do about it? Cause that's a big thing that we end on. I think you got to be advocating to Congress right now. You all need to be organizing a plan to handle the national election either way, either way or all the ways, right? I mean, <laughs> maybe that's more accurate. We don't know what way it's going to go, but we want to see four or five plans from you, Congress, that this is the instructions that states are to follow to ensure the election happens and that everybody has a chance to vote the right way. If if you care about the election, that's what it's time to do. We haven't said it in a while, but contacting congress.com contactingcongress.com. If you don't know your representative or your senator's information, that is the place to go. You put in your address and it'll tell you right there, email, phone, let them know now because we don't want to wait until we know they're slow. We don't want to wait until the last minute because we see what happens. States botch it when they wait till the last minute. Lance, if we want to invite other people to tune into this conversation, right, because that's how we grow this, uh, we've got a mission statement we're working to accomplish, and we need people to tune in if we're going to see that accomplished. Well, we here at True Chat, we are, our hope is to that we are educating people by providing honest, open, and respectful conversations. And you're our biggest fans, and you've got to get uh, more people to listen because that's how we can change the world around us into a better place. And you can do that by listening to us. Uh, you can tell them they can find us on Stitcher, on Spotify. Apple Podcasts, and anywhere else fine podcasts are found. The State of Us is a great resource. Books, links, and more. Remember, contactingcongress.com, contactingcongress.com. For the State of Us on True Chat in Urbana, Ohio, I'm Justin T. Weller. And I'm Lance Jackson. Special thanks to our producer, Bradley Butch. And as always, thank you all at home or wherever you are to making this show possible. We'll see you next time. Be the change. Be sure to check out our website, thestateofus.org, for books, articles, and all the ways to tune in, thestateofus.org.